Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Dracula by Bram Stoker. So this was my reread for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon for the month of September. I've decided, by the way, that I'm probably going to continue this next year and continue doing one reread a month, and it will let me just kind of pick and choose what I want to reread, you know. And uh, each of my rereads I've been doing via audiobook. This is no different. I listened to an Audible production of it. It had uh, Tim Curry and Alan Cumming in it. It actually worked really well on audiobook because you had each of the different characters kind of speaking in their own voice, you know? Let me see if I've got a quick, uh, quick sample of it. Chapter 27. Mina Harker's Journal. 1 November. All day long you have travelled and at a good speed. The horses seem to know that they are being kindly treated. Oh, there we go, I see. Alan Cumming, Tim Curry, Simon Vance, Catherine Kelgren, Susan Durden, John Lee, Graham Malcolm, and Stephen Crossley do the voices in it. And what's cool is that each of them has their own, you know, each has a character and takes it. And I think what works really well is there are parts of this that are actually dictated to, um, like, a, a phonograph, which records your voice, which would have been kind of super futuristic at the time. I'll talk about that some more later. I'll read you the blurb now, and then I'm going to jump on in to my notes on it. Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find the great undead, and cut off his head and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. In 1897, at the age of 50, Bram Stoker was touring manager to the actor Henry Irving, and was enjoying a modest success as a journalist and writer. Publication in that year of Dracula was to bring him international fame. The Dracula mythology has inspired a vast subculture, but the story has never been better told than by Stoker. His myth is powerful because it allows evil to remain mysterious. Virtuous action has no more impact than Jonathan Harker's shovel. The high virtue of Lucy can simply be drained away, as her blood is drained away, until she too joins the vampire brood. Van Helsing's high thinking and scientific skill cannot resist the dreadful potency of the undead. Only the old magic, a crucifix, garlic, a wooden stake, can provide effective weapons against the Count's appalling power. Now, I would say that's a spoiler that on the back it talks about Lucy becoming a vampire, which happens really far into it. But anyway, so my notes, alright, so I thought to begin with, it's kind of comical almost in the beginning that Harker ignores all of the warning signs about Dracula's castle. So there's a, a the woman in the hotel says, must you go? It's the eve of St. George's Day and it's rumoured that at midnight all the evil things come out to play. Everyone's crossing themselves and he's like, no, I'm just going to ignore all that. And it adds this sense of irony as a, like a modern reader who's very well aware of all the Dracula mythology and whatnot, that, you know, he's going to meet a vampire and he's just ignoring all of these warning signs. There was a bit where Dracula stands in front of a flame and Harker can see the flames through him, which I thought was interesting, like an interesting, I suppose, take on vampire mythology. Uh, there was a bit as well where he passed the pinching test, so he said he basically he pinched himself to see if he was still awake, if he was dreaming or if he was awake, and he was awake. I've got a note here, I'm just going to read this out. I wrote, he was among the Carpathians, but I bet Kim wasn't there. That was just a bad joke. He was amongst the Carpathian Mountains. So Transylvania, where this is set, is now in modern day Romania, I believe. I like that. Uh, I thought it was cool that when he gets there, Dracula tells him to enter freely and of his own will. And uh, so Harker does, and then he doesn't get let back out. I thought it was, in it was interesting as well that the reason that Jonathan Harker was sent to meet Dracula and not his boss in the firm was that his boss has gout. I think his boss actually later dies in it as well and Jonathan becomes the head honcho, you know. I thought it was interesting uh, when he goes inside, the Count feeds him and the Count gives him uh, roast chicken. And I thought it was interesting because like Harker is almost a, like a roast chicken to Dracula in a sense. He's food for him. One interesting part was when uh, Dracula calls him Harker Jonathan instead of Jonathan Harker and then he apologises for falling into what he calls his country's way of putting the patronymic first which is in, you know, if you've ever read Russian or something like that they do that a lot there as well. It was a great quote, uh, they say that those who are close to death die at dawn or the changing of the tides. Then we have the, uh, what I described in my notes as the nymphomaniac lady vampires and I'm, I'm not sure how well they hold up in sort of today's era of political correctness, I suppose. Um, it, it does feel a bit obligatory almost, but 
I'm not complaining. I th it was fine for me. I mean, I'm a white guy, so what do I know? But um, I also liked the phrase used to describe them. One of them was described as having a look of ribald coquetry. Then we get to the point where you know that Jonathan Harker is in trouble because Dracula is getting him to write letters and to like date them in the future, which is never good. There was a, a different meaning of the word molestation as well. So um, Harker said it was always in the darkness that he was molested, by which he meant, you know, I suppose... Uh, you know, bad things happening in the. I don't want to give too many spoilers, but the bad things happening once he's under uh, Dracula's control. It actually it took two hours into the audiobook for Jonathan Harker to start realizing what Dracula is, and by this point we've been kind of with Harker all the way through, and then we get to see some of the other characters. So then we switch to uh, Lucy's point of view, and I thought what was interesting is that she sympathised with Desdemona from Othello, which I read recently. Dr. Seward, who runs like the uh, lunatic asylum, basically, where Renfield is. Dr. Seward is uh, my age, which kind of freaked me out because I'd always just thought of him as older, you know. I, uh, I really liked when we were in Whitby, all the narrators had to do the uh, Yorkshire accent as well. And they all did a pretty good job of it. Just wrote, there are so many great characters. It's one of those books where every character is a standout character you know I liked Quincy actually Quincy's always been one of my favorites I like Renfield as well and his obsession with spiders is interesting even um, the captain of the of the ship so um, the, the schooner that arrives in Whitby that, and this is the ship that's brought Dracula to the UK and uh, the captain of the ship is like lashed to the mast uh, not to the mast he's lashed to the rudder and uh, he's dead when it when it arrives but you get to see his his journal of how he got there and even he's a great character as well we have a mention of the spca which is the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals it wasn't the rspca by that point because it had not yet gained royalty status and uh, they were there to make sure that the dog that came off the boat was okay but i'm pretty sure the dog is a, a manifestation of dracula and also it's a black dog which is interesting you know symbolism as well there's uh the bit where Mina thinks that she accidentally pricked Lucy with a safety pin and she's getting really sad and she's mad at herself because her friend is ill and she's trying to look after her and she thinks she caused her more damage. But actually it's not, it's two teeth marks. And then we get to uh, transfusions are used as well, which is quite cutting edge for the time this was written really. Uh, the same goes for, as I said earlier, with the phonographs, how they're using a phonograph to record themselves talking. In many ways it's ahead of its time. Even I, I keep a journal, it's, uh, where is it, it's here. Shout out to Minxlaura123 who bought my journal as well and sent it to me with some goodies. But I keep a journal and write it by hand, so I thought it was interesting that Dr. Seward is keeping a journal on a phonograph. Whereas, you know, I have more of a reason to do that because of the accessibility of, you know, voice recording technology. Everyone's got a phone, I mean, I've got my microphone here. I was... I found I was relating to Jonathan quite a lot throughout it, especially after he kind of escaped from Dracula's clutches because he basically has anxiety and then his boss dies and he kind of has to take over the firm and he's like, how am I even going to do this? I'm just coming to terms with my anxiety. There was a quote from Van Helsing, I believe, that was a great quote. He says, the Nosferatu doesn't die like a bee when it stings you. They went to see somebody as well who uh, the very prospect of beer had started him early on his debauch which I basically think of as pre-drinking. He started drinking at home before going to the pub. Another, there's a quote as well, which I believe is Van Helsing again. It's one of the quotes from Dracula that really stands out for me and that I've kind of remembered throughout the years and it's, euthanasia is an excellent and comforting term. I'm grateful to whoever invented it, which I, I mean, I'm pro-euthanasia, so, you know, maybe you guys aren't, but uh, I, I still think that's a, a powerful quote today. And then at the point at the end where they're after the Count and they're chasing after him, it's actually the day before Halloween during part of the chase, although they get to him afterwards. And uh, I like that they're using uh, cookery and bowie knives as well. They're very cool. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this. I'm on low battery and I don't want to ramble forever. Suffice to say, I really did enjoy it. As for my rating, I had rated it 4 out of 5 stars on Goodreads, but when I went back in, I changed it to 5 out of 5 stars, and it's just one of my all-time favourite classics. Absolutely love it. Recommend. So on that note, thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read Dracula, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.